All right, three, two, one. There you are. You're a stiff again. It's a podcast. What are you doing? I thought about switching out of my Fox and Friends outfit and putting on a T-shirt to try to be cool, but that felt like a lot of effort. And I have to do outnumbered and Varney, and then I have to redo the tie, and then the makeup gets on the shirt, you know, and I because, you know, I don't take my makeup off right away after the show. And so here we are. I'm a stiff, and you're comfortable. And you know what? At some point, you arrive at the age where you realize it's too much effort to be cool. It's not natural anymore. It takes effort to be cool, and then yeah. you're okay being uncool. I'm, which, I'm cool with being uncool, and I knew I was walking into this scenario, and here we are. And so, which we're both I pretty baked uncool in. the majority of the time. Let's do this, <laughs> a second edition of Will and Pete. Story number one. Elon Musk is going to buy Twitter, or at least he's trying. Elon Musk has put in a bid for roughly $41 billion. It's 50% above the stock listing price. He's coming in, Pete, like a gangster, saying essentially this isn't a back and forth. It isn't a negotiation. This is a take it or leave it deal. The future of Twitter as an investment requires me to take it private. And in response to Elon Musk, being someone devoted to free speech, it appears much of the left and some of the employee base of Twitter, Pete, is prepared to lose their mind and possibly their job. Yes, fire up the counselors, the therapists at Twitter headquarters. I didn't I didn't see this coming. I mean, maybe in the last week or so when he when he bought the nine percent share. And I think that's where we don't think outside the box enough. Like I kept thinking Twitter's gone. Um, what are the alternatives? Is it parlor? Is it truth social? What is it? Because we need to find our own ecosystem. And then a game changer type of guy. I mean, this is only 15% of his net worth. So he, he can do this. And it, the consequences of this, of an actual town square being recaptured, it feels like a potential for a reversal that didn't feel like it was possible. And it is gangster. He's, he's not, he didn't join the board to be on the board. He doesn't want to get invited to the parties. He's like, here are all my chips. He Apparently, the offer was best and final. Like, here's right. why it's worth the value. And I think the gamble he's made, not the gamble, but the, the, the leverage he's saying is, and he said it in the statement, if he doesn't, if he's not able to buy it and take it private, then he's going to go, then he's going to pull out his shares, which probably tanks the, 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 uh, the price of Twitter and Twitter already he's pointed out in the last couple of weeks how it's on the ropes and less relevant. So he's made this public case about the fragility of, of Twitter. And now he's turning around and saying, I'll, I'll make it great again, but I'm going to take it private. And if you don't take it, your share is going to tank. Really interesting to see where this goes. And it gives me hope. It's kind of like I don't know. I don't know if this is the right comparison. Will remember when Con- Kanye West put out, you know, that hit religious album and i thought hey if kanye west and, and was in the maga hat and the in the in the in the oval office and you it just twisted your mind in ways you're like i didn't see that coming if the tesla spacex guy becomes the guy who finally you know wakes up the woke and says you know it's okay for maybe the former president to be on twitter and changes the conversation good for him like we need billionaires that step up and have principles and he might be one of them So I want to come back to banking on billionaires and the parallel economy in just one moment. But as far as whether or not Elon Musk can wake people up, I don't know. I'm I'm I guess the question may be, Pete, how how reflective of the American public is the American left? And more specifically, how reflective of the American public is the American journalist? I think we both know instinctually not reflective and totally out of touch. But still, I don't think that can keep us from standing mouth agape at the response from many within journalism and many on the left at the prospect of Elon Musk buying Twitter and being a free speech absolutist. I I was taken aback. First of all, Max Boot at one time was someone (laughs) who described himself a man of the right. You may know him because I know him well. Yes, I don't. I've never met him, but he had the audacity to tweet something like in order to in order for democracy to survive we have to embrace content moderation more not less now let me translate that content moderation is the modern day euphemism it's the orwellian 1984 phrase for censorship it is pure and utter censorship and he's making the argument for democracy to survive we have to embrace censorship and he's therefore afraid of elon musk and (laughs) 
I translated this on Twitter for what it's worth that democracy also means simply their unchecked power. But I'm just really, really taken aback at the openness at which the American journalist now says, let's embrace the muzzle. Let's embrace censorship. It's a great point. You know, the word democracy doesn't mean what the left uh, says no. it means. I mean, they've done it all the way back to the Frankfurt School and the Marxists when they arrived on the scene. They changes, change those words and call it democracy and call it something they're for. Uh, I should uh, change it. I don't know Max Boot anymore. I knew him, you know, 10 years ago. It's been a long time. But he's a neoconservative, which are really just liberals who wanted to find a reason to fight a war. And ultimately, uh, his view on this has nothing to do with conservatism at all. I, I think the scary part is we had a watchmaker on the show this morning who's putting out a video about gender saying, you know, a woman is a woman. And he, he raised a scary point. And, I, and we've talked about this. These corporations and, and not to expand beyond Twitter, but they're making a bet that their future customers want this woke stuff, that the educational pipeline is creating an appetite for climate action, creating an appetite for gender action. So censorship and and they're they're hoping and believing this this uh, generation is already used to the idea of disinformation and these euphemisms. And they'll want it because they want the safer, more comfortable carefully manicured space in which to have their conversations it's what they're used to free speech freaks them out like elon yeah. musk is like a bond villain to them and i, I that, that's why i don't know how we I, I don't know i hope he succeeds but it's not a lot of the speed work's already been done in the culture so glenn greenwald pete had tweeted this out it was i think a message from the ceo of rumble and he was laying out an email he got from i believe and I could be wrong on the exact affiliation, but maybe it was a journalist or an editorial board at the Daily Mail. It was a traditional longstanding newspaper where they were asking Rumble, hey, are you going to are you going to start moving the direction of content moderation in the spirit of YouTube? In other words, hey, when are you going to start censoring information? Journalists asking for more censorship on every platform. And you may be right, man. And look. You and I are, are I, I think you're Gen X, I'm Gen X, you may be one of the older millennials, but look, whatever that may be, I believe in the 70s and 80s, and I, I mean, people older than us, free speech was sort of a universal value. I'm not sure yeah. you're, it is yeah. anymore. I don't think point, it is. So these corporations could be banking on a market that actually does exist. People out there may not want to hear ideas they disagree with. They, they may just want to have their idea reinforced. And in fact, beyond that, we're living in the age of narcissism where it's really about power now. So everyone's looking to be their own little mini Nero, right, and impose their power on everybody else. And if you can have Twitter reflect your values and exert their power over the people that you're, are your enemy, that may be the market now. Not it. It makes free the speech. conversation a lot easier. You know, if I can do a selfie video of myself about whatever I'm told I'm supposed to be for now and then be kept away from other people, which is basically what it is in schools right now. Well, go and especially with the reinforcement of the sort of mind of young people and with social media, it's, you know, post the black square post the pride flag. If not, what are you, a racist? Aren't you an anti-racist? Aren't you an ally? Like that pressure without any institutional pushback, which we see in the vast majority of schools, yeah. creates a consumer expectation. That's the scary part of this is we might be radicals in 10 years for being free speech absolutists deemed violent because of our advocacy for speech that people don't like. Because the founding documents were shredded a long time ago in the minds of a lot of people on the left. I, I hope I'm wrong. I really do. Maybe we're maybe we're going over the ledge on this. But well, I've said this in the past. A, it's a it's, it's a it's a wildfire in need of constant fuel. So if you are someone that feels like your enemies, your quote unquote enemies point of view is dangerous or unsafe or misinformation or disinformation that needs to be censored. You just need to realize that one day you will be disinformation because it doesn't just arrive at a place of utopia. It finds the next line to move and it will come for you. I'm 100 percent certain whoever you is, if you're watching, if you disagree with me, wherever that line is, it will come for you. It's a wildfire that never burns out. Last and thing before we move on. Comedians and, and famous people who have at least a cell in their brain, once they it comes for them, they say, whoa, whoa, I wasn't for this, not for yeah. me. It comes. You're right. 
So last thing before we move on, you brought up, and I said I wanted to come back to it, the parallel economy. And you and I have had this conversation off air. And I'm excited by the idea of a parallel economy because it, it, it's inherently positive and it's entrepreneurial. I want to see people with good values get rich and exploit Marcus distortions, right? So if Twitter or Facebook or YouTube wants to be the censorship platform, there's got to be a market unless you and I and the conversation we just had – denies it. There's got to be a market for free speech. But this week on the podcast, Pete, I've had Seth Dillon of the Babylon Bee who believes in parallel economies and he wants he wants the Babylon Bee to be that. And I've had Dave Rubin on who has created um, who has created parallel economies um, in terms of locals.com and others. Well, Seth believes you have to play in the institution, the existing institution. So while he's created the Babylon Bee, he thinks you still need Twitter, you still need Facebook, and you can't just you can't just say, okay, we give up on those platforms. We've got to be there to fight those platforms. Dave's like, forget those platforms. We're going to create our own. I, I'm, I don't know where I am yet on this. And, and clearly Elon is somebody who could possibly take a – uh, um, we'll call it a legacy institution for now and reform it. But I, I do like what Jesse Kelly said about this. He said, be careful banking on billionaires because maybe he's your hero today, but tomorrow when he has some other place, because I don't know what Elon Musk's political ideology is and I don't need him to reflect mm -hmm. my exact political ideology. I don't need that. But I do wonder with all his power today, he he advances it in pursuit of a value that I hold dear, free speech. Tomorrow, I don't know where Elon Musk will be. Yeah, I don't I you're right, can't bank on billionaires, but I, I don't have another bank shot. So yeah. I'll take this one. I'll take this one right here. T take the W if he gets it and move on. I guess I'm more with Dave Rubin. I just think that at this point, why participate in places that absolutely hate you and i guess i oftentimes think of that in terms of education but think of the media like you know if we went with that mindset fox news channel would have said well let's just get let's just try to get good republican guests on the other networks fox news said no let's create our own network that's better right. and 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 we're, and we're not going to try to promote it by going on abc nbc and cbs we're just going to make a better product and over time uh that you know there'll that's be an appetite point. for that so i don't know i just i think the longer you stick around in the legacy institutions, the more you continue to validate them with your presence. And I and yeah. I, I think at some point you got to cut bait. I think it's a great point. And by the way, for anyone watching and you may or may not have passionate opinions about Fox News, what I would just say this is without saying you have to subscribe to every single person's point of view on the Fox News channel, ask yourself this. Where would we be over the last 20 years if there were no Fox News? And I know there's a dystopian view out there. Oh, it's the worst thing. No, no, I'm serious. Think about this. Every other media institution has the same exact point of view. The Fox News Channel is the only one that is the outlier. <laughs> that in and of itself it is, crazy. is one hell of a statement. All it right. really is. Story number two. Um, 15 more days, Pete, to slow the spread. Uh, we are going to be at the Biden administration's behest, extending the mass transit trains and airlines mask mandate for 15 more days. COVID comes in or goes out exactly as it comes in on a 15 day cycle. <laughs> I mean, I saw I, I had it marked on my calendar, April 18th, you know, masks come off on planes. It is the last single place. I know you fly a lot to where I have to put on a mask. And it 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 just I hate it every time. I, it's gotten to the point where everyone on the plane hates it too, and most of the flight attendants do too. E e even the ones that lord it over, there are some of them. I mean, we can rail against the same drum of where's the science? There's no science. It has nothing to do with science. The CEOs have come right. out and said of airlines, we want the masks off. I just think it's they just can't there's enough loud voices we played the clip this morning of sunny hoiston hoston of the view saying how much she loves mask and she doesn't want to be around covid breathers I mean, she, <laughs> <I saw> can, <laughs> it. she can covid breathers uh i don't want your covid breath on wants. me you I don't want super your COVID spreaders breath. although she's in basically a hyperbolic chamber in a on an airplane that, where they recycle yeah. air every like three seconds so it, what a sad – you're right. It's going to go out with some lingering limp, which is what's happening right now. But you know, you know what? Well, hold on. The mandates are coming back. Philadelphia, other cities, yeah. they're starting to go back to the mass mandates because of a subvariant of a subvariant. Yeah. 
my characterization or framework of this news story may be wrong. We're not watching 15 days to slow the spread as COVID's exit stage left. We may be watching its entrance stage right, meaning we may be going back the other way. We may be starting to see mask mandates reinstituted in all these American cities. You know, um, you played basketball. I was a swimmer. Um, there's something about I, I was running yesterday and and I was thinking to myself, I want to teach my boys. And it's always about what I want to teach my boys. And we'll get to that mm-hmm. in just a moment. And I was running. I was doing this workout at this class. And um, I don't want to say CrossFit, but it was CrossFit, because if you say CrossFit, okay. then you're a CrossFit guy. And everything else ah. I have to say is only seen through the CrossFit guy prism. Now you're a CrossFit guy. I yeah. got it. Mm-hmm. But there, I think it was a set of four. And I was thinking on the run, I'm like, what's the worst one? Everybody goes hard on the fourth one, right? And I think everybody takes it easy on rep number two, right? So on, say you're running a mile and it's a four-lap <laughs> thing, right? Do you, you ever thought about this? Everyone comes out of the gates on lap number one pretty good and strong. And then everybody dials it back on lap two. And the real win is done in lap three because everybody goes hard in lap four. So if you're going to make up ground or separate yourself, the truth is you need to kick it into gear in lap two when totally everybody's downshifting. But, but three is where where the race is won. This is, I don't know what this Will has Kane, to do with 15 days to slow the spread, but I'm going to make it tie in impressed. just a moment. <laughs> unbelievably impressed, endlessly impressed with your ability to analyze the, <laughs> the CrossFit workout that you did and whether or not it's the second or the third lap where you make up ground. You hey, haven't what thought is it? about is it that? The... Well, uh, no, I have not. Not you since know why? like seventh grade when I ran the mile and I had to figure out which lap I was going to bust it on. Well, I, this is who you are, I think. You're probably an all-out, all-four-laps guy. I can see that well, about you. Well, you try, but you fail. I mean, yeah. you know, so uh, there should be more strategy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was a swimmer. So, I mean, chasing a black yeah. line and doing laps, like, hours a day was my thing. So I was always like, which one do we kick it in gear on? But here's yeah. why I bring this up and what it has to do with the CDC mask mandate. One more analogy. Uh, I worked on a ranch in Montana, and if you ever rode a horse – to get the horse to ride away from the barn, you are going to be spurring it on the whole time. I mean, you're kicking it side. Let's go. Let's go. When you turn around and you head back to the barn on the trail ride, you never have to spur the horse on. In fact, you're reining it. He he knows this thing's over. Let's get it on home. Let's go. There's 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 oats and hay uh, back at the yep. pellets and hay back at the barn. This is where I am on the mask mandate. Listen, I don't know anybody that flies as much as both of us. Okay. I've been wearing this mask thing on airplanes for two years now, several times a week. And it has gone from um, a place in the middle where I was like, this is just what we're doing. I hate it so much, Pete. I feel like I can't breathe anymore. I am squirming in my seat. It's turned into torture. And I think it's because I'm headed back to the barn. I think it's because I can (laughs) see the end. And I, and I think you're right. Everybody on the plane can. I'm done, man. We're all, and I don't even, it's down around my chin. It's off. I, I'm nursing the drinks. I have been for about seven months. I know yeah. you had the mesh mask for a while. <laughs> Camo mesh mask. <laughs> Maybe I still do. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that. But when I'm politely asked to put on a different mask, I, they get me one, and I do. <laughs> um, but otherwise, I like to breathe. Yeah. Anyway, it's I mean, also it, it, I think you're right. It's just... Everybody just it's just like, you know, when I'll think of, I'll put it in a military context. It's like when your your training's done and you're just waiting around for the commander or the first sergeant to come out and call the formation and everyone's just waiting around like the day's over. Just someone come out and call the formation to attention and, and get put it, send everyone on leave. And it just won't end. And you're like, we're all done. Everything's done. Where's the first sergeant? And he doesn't come out and you just wait and wait <laughs> and wait. There's no first sergeant. No one will come out and just say, OK, if you want to wear it voluntarily, you can. So, yeah, we need America needs a giant first sergeant to call the company to attention and just release everybody for the week. Dismissed. Dismissed. America's mask. Dismissed. <laughs> Story number three. Frank James has been arrested for the subway shooting in New York City. In the wake of the arrest of Frank James, several videos <clears throat> have come out of rantings on YouTube and other social media platforms where he has revealed racist beliefs. There's a lot of takeaways from this story. Potentially, we can I, you and I can have conversations about prosecution, criminal justice reform. We can talk about guns or we can talk about ideology. Here's what I would say before I ask you, Pete, what is our takeaway? 
I'm always hesitant, and I want to be intellectually consistent on this, to take maniacs and ascribe to them larger political beliefs to the population at large. Yeah. The left has done that continuously. I remember after the Gabby Gifford shooting, it became an indictment of the right at large. You cannot take an insane person and turn that into a Democrat. You can't take an insane person who shoots up stuff and turn that into a Republican. But I don't think it's irresponsible to listen to a man and listen to his words and ask ourselves, where do these types of thoughts come from and where do you hear them? So when you see the Frank James story for now, the New York subway shooting story for now, Pete, is there a larger takeaway? Uh, yeah, I think there is that there's utter – frankly, it's the, for me, who's someone who's a little bored of this story, and I don't mean that callously – uh, thinks it's a little bit New York centric, a lot of bit New York centric. Um, it's a takeaway that being insane in the subway and and mentally ill in the subway is, you know, Tuesday. It's Wednesday. Yeah. Lawlessness in the subway is the way it is right now. And frankly, until the smoke bomb went off or the grenade went off in that tra- train car, he was just like any other, you know, slightly insane homeless person who may or may not do something bad to the other people on the tra- train. Like this is a city that doesn't enforce the rule of law really at any level. And and then, you know, after that, he's a horrible person who clearly holds really crazy ideas, is messed yeah. up in the head, and his, his statements are clearly racist. By the way, you know, you can be black and be racist just like you could be white and be racist. Uh and as a result, did some crazy thing and was never deterred from doing it because right now there's there's a feeling of lawlessness in the city. And and he was able to take advantage of it. To your point of New York City, look, I lived in New York City for 15 years. I essentially raised my boys through the first at least third of their life or their third of their life that they're spent in my home in New mm-hmm. York City. And And you're exactly right. I can't tell you how many times. Either on the street or on a subway car, your encounter with someone ranting and raving in a crazy slash close to menacing way, right? It, it, all the time. And you're asking yourself, should I switch train cars? Is this person serious? And I don't want to say nine times out of ten because it feels like ten times out of ten it ends with this menacing yelling. And all of a sudden for the, me, this story is, no, 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 this was a dude that I encountered dozens of times throughout my life in New Absolutely. York City who actually acted on all that insanity, who actually did it. And, it, it, you know, you and I, have, I haven't told this story publicly, and I'm not going to tell it right now, but, you know, I've had a personal public safety issue at my home uh, in Dallas. So you're no, nowhere is immune to this stuff. And all of a sudden when the stats turn and you can tell yourself like it never happens to you, the stats, all of a sudden you, you reevaluate everything. So right in that subway in New York City, you know, 10 times out of 10, they're just ranting and raving. Oh, yeah, but what about the one time out of 100 now? And it is Frank James. But here's, here's where I wanted to go with this man on the racism side. And I, I, I am going to make a concerted effort to be as extremely responsible as I can and not ascribe the motivations of an insane person to a movement at large. But let me just tell you, I believe we are in the rise of neo-racism. That racism has been re-embraced in America under the guise of anti-racism. Hmm. And the stuff that you hear about – or the stuff that you heard from Frank James was only on these YouTube videos a few degrees of separation from the kinds of stuff that you actually hear on college campuses or in best-selling books or on cable news channels. It's shocking that we have allowed ourselves to get to a point, I think, where we tolerate open racism – on cable news about white people did this or, you know, John Stewart had a thing. <laughs> and, and I think the title of it was the problem with white people. That in itself is a problem. The problem with white people. This is how you create a culture and environment of neo-racism that leads people, not leads, can lead to the, the soil in which this insanity grows. That you're, I'm not you're, saying I'm not saying Frank James John Stewart direct connection, but I am saying is America at large is embracing neo racism and tolerating this conversation to where when you hear Frank James you think and to be honest if you're watching or, or, or listening to this when you hear Frank James ask yourselves like I kind of I've kind of heard similar stuff <laughs> on social media. Yeah, you're not doing a one-to-one, which is what the left does, right? Like, that happened, so Donald Trump is responsible. Like, that's not what we're talking about here. What you're saying is, and you're entirely right, there is an entire 
intellectual movement on the left to rationalize and justify racism back at white people because of racism in the past as a payback from the 1619 Project to Ibram X. Kendi to anti-racism. The justification yeah. is yell at, demean, and 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 blame white people as much as you want to include the stuff he posted on YouTube and elsewhere, which was blatantly racist and violent. And that's OK. Yet what we hear – you heard this. Alejandro Mayorkas, our DHS secretary, said, what, a week ago that the biggest threat we face in America today is white supremacy yet again. Uh, it, it's over and over and over. I'm still looking. Uh, I spent a lot of time across this country. Still. So do you to a lot of uh, red areas with a lot of you know, white people. And I'm still waiting to meet that white supremacist. Uh, and I'm in the military, too, where maybe there's a lot of white supremacists still waiting. Uh, it's a manufactured and, and made up violent threat and yet the kind of rhetoric if they if you believe and and if you believe that speech can be violence then how is that kind of speech not possibly a predicate for violence and again not to blame anybody in particular for this but yeah it's out there and it's it's encouraged on cable news and yeah. in, in in philosophy in 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 our classrooms yeah. yes and super dangerous we're teaching it selling it and making it popular and then we can't act surprised when it's perverted into violence again yep. not a one-to-one -one correlation but you create a climate and environment that not just tolerates but celebrates neo-racism it's going to take us down a dark path before we leave this story i know you in speaking of you know the ideology of Ibram X. Kendi or Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. I know you were particularly entertained with BLM co-founders Patrice Cullors' um, problem with having to reveal that she used BLM funds to buy multi-million dollar mansions. Yeah, so she is flabbergasted that her nonprofit organization is required to file what is known as a 990, which is basically a tax disclosure for what you do with the money that you get because you get a your money is tax deductible, right? So as taxpayers, we deserve to know who benefits from that tax code and the IRS deserves to know whether or not you're adhering to it. So a big part of that whole process, you know, the whole sunlight deal is that yeah. it's publicly available. And she went on this big, long rant like, oh, it's so harming to me and, and, and it triggers me that I have to. I mean, what is the and it, it kind of you, that I, I have to be, file and reveal the use of my funds. It's triggering I to me. It's triggering. I would not be surprised if eventually the justification is because we've seen this all over the place. This is the patriarchy of of, you know, privileged, you know, uh, white privilege that created this system that exposes and, I, you know, people who are marginalized or historically marginalized should not have to adhere to such a structure uh, and and. What did you expect? You you live in America. You run a nonprofit. People are going to see this. These are the rules. But there's a new thread intellectually to say that the rules themselves are racist because anything mm -hmm. that existed before this I'm now woke moment is racist. So that's that's where the mentality comes from. It's not that she thinks she's uh, above the law per se, it's that the laws are wrong and she shouldn't have to follow them. And don't you know if we wanted to buy a mansion, we're so good that we should be able to do that. It's really ugly. And I hate – I hate when you – I don't like the fact that we're having to live in this world where it all translates into some sort of deeper view that comes back to to racism or a view of racism. But it's it's what they've infected our brains with right now. Yeah, and it's become the ultimate get-out-of-jail-free card or ripcord yeah. on the parachute. I feel unsafe. I Story feel unsafe. number four, speaking of um, feeling unsafe – it's quantifiable. We have the stats on the rise of crime in the United States of America. And beyond the stats, the images and the lifestyle changes tell the story. So in San Francisco, an uh, image came out this week of a Walgreens. Every single aisle, every single item locked up. It's behind lock and key. The plastic dividers come down. The plastic folds come down. There is a lock. And you got to flag down the associate to come over here and get your old spice. I use that 
that literal specific example because I've had to do that in New York City. But now mm-hmm. it's not just the deodorant. It it's used to be just everything. it used to be razors. It used to be only razors. You get right. a razor, you got to get somebody to unlock it. It was always a hassle. Well, yes. it was a price point driven thing, right? I think if there was yes. an item that you were buying, what what is a pack of razors? Fifteen bucks? I don't I don't know anymore. It's really expensive. It's always been excessively expensive. Yeah. And you used to have to ask, can you unlock the Mach 3s, please? I, I need to shave. <laughs> um, but now it's everything, man. It's every single thing, I guess, down to the price point of what a tube of toothpaste costs. You, you have to ask for help at San Francisco Walgreens. And, why, and, and you know what? It's, why is it always the places where the Second Amendment has been effectively removed that are the most dangerous? <laughs> so it, it's, tr- it's true. Like I was having a debate with one of, the, one of our great camera guys on Fox and Friends today, and he was saying, well, you can't have guns in New York. And I'm kind of looking at him, well, why not? If I could pass a background check and I'm a law-abiding citizen, why do I not have the ability to defend myself? Why am I subject? Why can't I? You can't even order a, a, a pe- pepper spray or a taser to New York City. Do you know that? So you're, think about this. You're a young woman. You send your young 24-year-old female off to go work in the big city, San Francisco or New York. She's got to ride the subway. I mean, it's, it is putting your well-being in the hands of complete strangers with a demoralized police force in underground tubes. Uh, yeah. it, 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 that's not real freedom. It's not real freedom when you got to go to Walgreens and ask someone else to unlock the container. Uh, I, I just – when you when – you, when you don't have the ability to defend yourself, criminals know the vacuum exists. And then you add prosecutors and you add bail reform laws and you add defunding the police. And you've just I mean, it's it's lawlessness. And yeah. it's coming I laughed, to by the way, you if you want it. I laughed because when you said that, when you brought up Second Amendment, I didn't know that's where you were going to go with this. It reminded me immediately of um, one of my favorite movies, which I told you to watch, which was Hell or High Water. And it's about these two brothers that bank rob across Texas. Yes, I watched it. I and watched I, it. it. There's this scene when they're robbing a bank, you know, and they're in these small towns in Texas. And, um, you know, there's an old man, a customer in the bank. And he says, you got a gun on you, old man? He goes, you're damn right I got a gun on me. <laughs> you know, so they have to disarm the customers before they can rob the place, you know. Uh, and by the way, I'm with you, man. Look, I think people think of everybody having a gun. I, you know what? As a hypothetical counterfactual what would the world look like i i you know i think people presume it would look like i don't know gun violence in africa where it's much easier to have a gun i think or the wild wild west right 1800s america but let's say that every place was open carry right so you know you're on the new york city subway and a guy's ranting and raving like we talked about just a story ago and on that same train car you can see three guys with a pistol holstered onto their belt onto their hip I, I have to think, and of course we can't prove the outcomes. I have to think Frank James is a little less willing to just go on his spree because he doesn't get as far before he gets return fired. He knows he has cooped up, trapped victims. All of a sudden, not everyone in this car is a victim if there's three armed men. Now, of course, the, the, the rebuttal will be, well, how often do just little – those verbal spats on New York City subways yeah. – Result yep. in, you know, draws. But I don't know the answer to that. But I do that's know that illegal. right now we're turning ourselves that's illegal. And yes. if you shoot someone illegally, you will go to jail for the rest of your life if you shoot right. them. So you better have real stringent actual laws. And by the way, if you're a felon or you're mentally ill, you're not allowed to carry a weapon. So presumably, if you enforce the law right, you've got law abiding citizens. Anybody from a gangbanger to a drug dealer to a common criminal is going to think twice about what they do if that store or that streetcar or whatever is, contains someone who's legally carrying a firearm. Yeah, I, I just I I get the I know the other argument that people make. I just at this point call me not just a one a absolutist but a two a absolutist. Like yeah. it, it, when you when you when you really strip it down. Um, it's only and by you the way, can defend yourself. it's not hypothetical. Look, Texas is a wide open carry state now. It's not it's not concealed carry and it's not licensed carry anymore. It's wide open free carry. And you don't hear stories of people getting in big arguments over Texas versus Texas A&M and drawing down on each other. It just it's not happening. Right. So um, uh, I'm with you. I'm I'm a two way yeah. absolutist. And by the way, to put a button on this story the united states postal service apparently this week discontinued service for a while in santa monica california because it's not safe enough to deliver the mail so 
There we are in America. There you have it. There you Story have it. Story number five. I want to talk about this one with you um, because, honestly, I think it's become one of my favorite subjects. We always think about everything through the prism of our own lives. When you first have kids, you start seeing every entrepreneurial venture through, hey, this could be a good kid's toy startup or whatever it may be. You and I are both in the fatherhood raising men stage of our lives. Uh, you have you have a daughter, uh, two daughters. Um, mm-hmm. I have uh, two sons. And by the way, on top of your two daughters, you have five sons. So, <laughs> you know, like what you got, you're raising a lot of young men. I'm raising a couple of young we men. We both are. It's 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 my focus. Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida this week, um, proposed put together a proposal. He's putting a bill out there to focus on fatherhood. I believe it's 70. I can't remember the exact figure, but it's a lot of money going to grants to help uh, incentivize fatherhood, recognizing, I believe, a one in four children in America grow up in a home without a father. It's even obviously worse, and for some reason it's controversial to point out the truth, as always, but I believe it's somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of black households you're growing up in a home without a father. This is an absolute travesty that creates a social, a social contagion, a problem, just metastasizes. Tony Dungy, the former NFL head coach, mm-hmm. stood with Ron DeSantis, and Tony Dungy is black. And he received a ton of criticism. Now, some of this, Pete, I believe, is because, oh, Ron DeSantis has been painted as the current Correct. bad guy. Right. It's about the trans issues. It's about Ron DeSantis's leadership and popularity. But Tony Dungy fired back. The things that Ron DeSantis is saying about fatherhood are the exact same things that were said by Barack Obama. Why is it wrong for me to stand for fatherhood today? Good for Tony Dungy. You know him. I mean, absolute class act, start to finish. Uh, I I will say, we're at the point where the modern Democrat Party won't even define what a mother or a father is, what a man or a woman is, let alone take a definitive statement on the importance of fatherhood. So from step one, I mean, Tony Dungy works at NBC, I believe. You know, NBC is ultra woke. Uh, you got plenty of blue check marks that are always looking for any violation, as you can, more fuel for the fire. He stands with Ron DeSantis. Somehow and somehow that's horrible. And I, I love it. He just backed it up on Twitter and said, this is where Obama was 14 years. Now it's totally unacceptable for me. And hopefully it triggers a uh, maybe it triggers a bigger conversation about this. We had a guy on the show who wrote, you know, first class fatherhood. I believe you've done the podcast. He has a yeah. book out about it because fatherhood is. It is the most important legacy you leave behind by far. No doubt. For, father, for sons or daughters. And as you get older and we're both getting older, you realize a lot of the crap you thought was important isn't important at all. And, and you know, I'm coming at it from a, a, an often challenging aspect of a blended family and some geography involved. And so I yep. grapple with the emotions of that and how to handle that. Yet I want to be – I want to pour everything I can, can into all those kids. And fathering – sons and daughters is beautifully different uh and it's just to to think that there are so many kids that don't have a father that they even know or gives a damn is probably when you that's why i love what um our good friend uh what's his name my goodness why am i missing it right now he's Uh, not that good a friend jack brewer no jack brewer (laughs) i mean what he's what he does in prisons and he was the reason i thought of his his name is because he stood there with desantis as well and was a part of that bill down in florida he goes to prisons and mentors, you know, men who didn't have fathers or they aren't fathers. I mean, if you really want to address societal ills, that this would be about a number one where you would I think start it is. with it. I think it and is. I think it's above education. Dance. I think it's above education. I think the number one thing you you could do to improve society would be to encourage fatherhood. It's not to diminish motherhood because motherhood is equally as important, but we don't seem to have the motherhood crisis that we have when it comes to fatherhood. You use such an important word, legacy. When I was a younger man, and I still hold to this at some point, some level, and I'm sure you do as well. Like I think all men are attracted to the idea of legacy. It's, I guess, our grasp at immortality, right? And not to try to get too too you know yep. pseudo philosophical but what do what remains after we are done and probably in my 20s you know it's like i'm going to create um and i did want to create a media company that that would be something that maybe my that generations 
beyond me could run. My name could stay atop. And I think it's why men build buildings, you know? I think it's why Trump... <laughs> it's, I think It starts it's why, with Legos, man, and it goes yeah. to tall buildings or whatever. It's why Trump's yes. got his name on everything. It's about legacy. But what I think you realize as you get older, first of all, you acquire some humility, but, but and maybe I'm yep. not going to build that tower, you know? But, but whatever, <laughs> it, it doesn't matter because the more important legacy is the one inside your own home. You definitely have the ability to build that empire. And it will carry your name. It will in my family, at least. You yeah. know, it will carry your name. And I don't know, man. You know, you and I talk about, and these are things we talk about off camera, but like, you know, I mean, faith. And I'm, and I'm honest with my audience. This is a, faith is a constant work for me. It's, it's a work in progress. But I, I can say with all honesty, I am working on that. But I, I know that for most of my life, the idea of what it is to be a man has been so important. Like, a man doesn't brag, I don't think. A man isn't petty. A man probably doesn't get in tweet fights. I've, I've failed on all of these things. Let me, let me be real. We all have. Yeah, I've failed on all of these things. But, like, I know conceptually at least what I think it is to be a man, and I want to help these two boys in my house become a man. And that's one hell of a legacy. And I just want to say this because we're kind of doing this and we're free-forming it. Honestly, man, you know, look, I don't do gratuitous compliments, and it's not worth it. It's one of my favorite things about you. There's a lot of things that I love about our friendship, but, like, I see how dedicated you are. When we play football on the beach in Daytona between shows, <laughs> no, I'm serious, and you got all your kids out there, and you're not wearing your shirt because you got to make sure everybody else sees, you know, what you're bringing to the table. But <laughs> Next time on the Will and Pete, next time on the Will and Pete, I'll go shirtless for you, too. No, Deal. man, but it's one of my favorite things because clearly it's at the center, it's, it's, you know, you can you can talk to me about your priorities and your hierarchy and what what you put at the top and it should I I do believe it should be faith it should be number one above above honestly above wife and above children but um, I can see how high being a fatherhood is on your hierarchy of priorities like likewise for for you to make this a love fest I mean the amount <laughs> you, the way. Well, but the way you examine the, 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 the character development and the molding you want for your boys has led me to be more self-examining of it, other than the default of, okay, you know, we're going to play basketball or we're going to do this. Like, how am I morally and, and, and ethically and courageously challenge them on tasks that maybe I never did or would never consider? Uh, and it does take intentionality. Otherwise, the days and the weeks and the months, they just fly by. And oh, pretty soon do. you're realizing, Man, they do. I, didn't, I didn't teach my kids this, or why didn't I introduce them to this? And so it does take some time to sit to, to, to think, how do I want to shape them and what will it look like? And that's why to bring it full circle, we, it, it, you know, it feels like we are oftentimes, to use a phrase, you know, that we're pissing in the wind in the media when we're talking about this shiny object or that shiny object or this or that, because the answers in front of us are so freaking obvious. Like if we don't incentivize, you know, fathers to be involved and mothers to be involved and in creating the kind of homes that that's why I remember before I got interested in politics, I realized if you, I remember this, it was decades, I don't know, 15 years ago. I thought if I really want to change the world, I should really become a pastor. Um, because it's, it's the changing, it's the shaping of the souls first in faith and in families that actually does the heavy lifting in our society. Mm -hmm. And I realized my heart was inclined to want to be involved in policy and be involved in the military. And so that wasn't, can you imagine Pete, the pastor, like that's scary, <laughs> uh, <laughs> not happening. But, but I, but I think while we, while we deal in the shiny objects of news and, and all the other things like remembering the, the faith and the fatherhood and the things that ultimately solve problems. And that's where I think the left and the right have gigantic missing conversations because the left has decided God isn't real and parents and gender don't matter. And when you start from that threshold, you're just failing generations of kids. And it's it, that's why I go back to the ecosystems. That's why I'm so passionate about classical Christian school. Mm -hmm. And I love is again, but that's one step below the family, which is way more important than the school, even though the school is really, really important. You know, um, you said so something and I, uh, you know, you know, I've talked about this um, and I'm, I'm inclined to wrap this up because, you know, I don't know how long people listen, but I'm actually really personally enjoying this conversation. Um, and I don't know what time you have to do Varney today, but I got to go do minutes. Varney in like 10 minutes, but they can wait. 
Stuart is a great dude, and he'll say it in he his is. English accent, and you'll say to him, <laughs> you were with Will, and he'll forgive you. Um, Correct. You, you know, I, I've, I've surrounded myself with people from the left throughout my life on purpose in some way. You know, I lived in the Upper West Side of New York because I wanted to be challenged. And you said, you know, those on the left, you know, have said God's not real and have de-emphasized the family. And I know that many of my friends on the left would take issue with you on that. But what I would say to them is this. That might not apply to you as an individual, but you do have to begin to step back and ask yourself where the ideology you're subscribing to. And you are subscribing to an ideology has embraced some radical stuff. And you don't have to look hard and far. You just don't have. That's to. what I always say. Like you, these congressmen that they try to run and say, "Well, I'm not that kind of Democrat." It's like, yeah, but when you vote for your Speaker of the House, you're going to vote for Nancy Pelosi. Yeah. Like ultimately, there's uh, you may have a great personal faith, and frankly, a lot of the elites who are left wing live very conservative lives. Yeah. Uh, they get married, stay married, have kids, save money. You know, all of the those are ultimately conservative actions, but. Yeah, it doesn't mean every left winger or every Democrat is godless. That's not what I'm saying. But the the trajectory of the policies and, and the things that they enforce um, certainly don't, don't show it. You don't have to look hard and far. There's a Vice headline out there right now about deconstructing the nuclear family. BLM embrace the idea of destroying the family. And you can say to yourself, those are crazies and those are outliers. And then I would ask yourself this. Over the last two years, how much of those crazies and outliers actually driven the national agenda? And I think it's pretty I it's think true. your answer is there. Last Dave, thing Dave on fatherhood, Ro- I'm failing. Oh, go ahead. I just want you to know. Uh, and everybody watching. I, I you what you know, they always look back and you can see what your parents did wrong. I know I can almost in real time say what I'm doing wrong. And my hands are too too gripping, too tightly gripping the steering wheel. I'm to your point of trying to mold them, I will bet my failure right now is I need to just say, let them figure it out on their own hmm. instead of giving them yet another sermon. <laughs> That's gonna be hard. That's gonna be hard, man. I think I'm I, I I can feel it too. I'm always gauging that that letting control letting loose of the control. Yeah. Uh, the blended aspect of what I have to deal with has forced me to do some of that. Um, but it's hard, and I don't know if I'm. I just yeah. You know, it's the only thing that makes me think and sends me down rabbit holes is what kind of kid is he or she, and what motivates her, and how do I steer them in the right direction? And it, there's no right. answer. And right. You got a, a lot of prayer. I'll tell you that. This has been awesome. Thank you. I've loved this Thanks, episode. brother. Let's do it again. I'll, we'll see you. Let's promote the heck out of it on the weekend show. Okay, let's, let's do, do it. it. See you later. Deal. All right.